Where do we need to begin this conversation to understand you? The conversation starts on a cornfield in rural Illinois in the late 80s, darling. What happens next? Oh, um, well, I went to school. My I come from a broadcasting family and like a family of journalists. My I grew up. Uh, my mom uh, worked in the local newspaper and advertising, and my dad worked in the TV station. Uh, so that's kind of where it started. I was born in 1987. I think that was like another really interesting time in queer history and what was to come for the next few years. Um, being that it was like the height of the height of the AIDS crisis. And I think understanding, not understanding that, but um, being a very queer, uh, effeminate, small child in that time, um, there was so much like anti-queer vitriol then, um, which I didn't like know that's what it was called, but I felt it. And it's so it's interesting being like this age now and having like this renaissance, not in the Beyonce way of like such anti-queer sentiment. You're f five years old when your parents separate. Mm -hmm. What's that like for you? I actually just had a joke about this in my new um, set. My first reaction was like, can I have the ring? Like my brothers are really devastated. I just was like all about that diamond. Like I've always loved jewelry. I was like, oh my God, that would look great with my geodes. So I didn't really understand like any sort of like emotional implication from like my parents' divorce. Um, love my dad, love my mom, but I was like, I kind of, I think I was like maybe too young to fully understand. I do think that it ultimately set me on like, um, like my stepdad and I, I, my mom started dating him when I was like six and I write a lot about him in my first book over the top. Um, his name was Steve. And so ultimately he taught me so much about what it is to be a good person, what it is to have integrity, what it is to ask for help. Um, he had been sober for 28 years when he died in 2012 and he was like, and he and my dad are both really important to me, but. Steve and my dad, like, were really good, um, you know, role models in my life in a lot of ways. And, but it took me, like, from, like, six to, like, 16 to, like, like Steve. Uh, but then I eventually, like, really, you know, loved Steve and appreciated him so much for all the things that he taught me. Ah, oh, thank you. Oh, stay out. Just for context, the shoulder thing is, uh, do you want to explain, Jonathan? Yes, it's like this gorgeous, like little like tube dress, honey. And what it can give you is this like turtleneck moment, but that's giving me too much restriction. It is pride. So we need the shoulder out because it's really like this Issey Miyake moment that's like the shoulders meant to peekaboo. Is that Issey Miyake? Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Pretty, right? Yeah, I love it. I don't want to scream in the microphone. I just get so excited talking about dresses. <laughs> so he's just told us to, what contingent on this interview was us letting him know whenever the the, the uh, Izzy Miziaki number just slides a little too high up, we've got to remind him to slide it down. Yeah. So if we say shoulder, that's what we mean. Um, how did you get on with your peers when you were that age? Did you feel like you fit, fitted in, per mm, se? No, no. Um, but I did have some really good friends and some people who I, I think I know I, I knew really early that friendship was really important. So I always had like some really close friends. Um, but a lot of times I think there was like, you know, quite a bit of like widespread bullying. But I think that that really hit a fever pitch, like more like, you know, like sixth grade, like post sixth grade. Like maybe pre that there was like little murmurings and like a little bit of weirdness. But I, I think kids are like so young at that age that they're not really like, or at least in my case, it wasn't like that horrific um, bullying wise. At the time, it was more like post sixth grade, I feel like. But I also, it's like so funny. I just noticed this like part of me that's like, like being 36 and still talking about it. Like I feel like, because mm. I have processed so much of it and I've worked so hard on letting go of a lot of that. And um, so like for me, it doesn't really hold a lot of, like, like Brene Brown, she talks about like, you know, can you talk about your trauma without becoming your trauma? And I think in I, like, I think it's actually still kind of hard for me to talk about. Like I have this like harder part that kind of comes up and is like, oh, like I just don't like going there. But I am down to go there. Your square chin makes me feel safe. Mm. But yeah, you know what I'm saying? Well, you you take me there. You take me to where you want to go because I am. I, um... In my own experience, only black kid in an all white school. I grew up in Devon in the Southwest, which is like the countryside. So I remember the feelings of just constant, because it's a small town as well, and you're different. This constant feeling of almost a constant state of fight. Like my body was always in fight or flight almost, mm. just like subtly. Mm. 
And I read I read hints of that in your story, but please do tell me um, what your experience was. No, that totally, that absolutely resonates. I think I also write a lot about like this idea that like, um, like a lot of like joy and like happiness can coexist with grief and like shame, like these emotions don't necessarily like invalidate each other. Mm -hmm. So even though I did have um, a lot of hardships and there was abuse and there was bullying and there was a lot of othering, like I think that's why I'm still so obsessed with figure skating and gymnastics. Like when figure skating and gymnastics was on the TV, I was the happiest person of all time. Like none of the other things mattered. So I think those kind of moments of like escapism, like were these really healing moments why even now as an adult, like those types of things are so exciting for me. And mm -hmm. I'm just like so into it because it, I think it like it, it strikes at like that core memory of like just being really into something else, um, which I'm glad I'm still into that, even though I'm like more into my life now than I was. And obviously, like I did get out of there and I did like, you know, a lot of my dreams came true. The escapism what, in that situation, what were you escaping from? Feeling like really, I mean, I, I was like I said, a really queer kid and a very like cis het world so my hometown is like my family was like quite well known in my hometown and i was really like unabashedly myself and so there was a lot of like feedback from that as i got older so that i think that was like a lot of and i also was you know abused i am a survivor of sexual abuse so there was like like I would hear about like other kids and like, you know, whether it was like poverty or like see it on the news, like kids or like even just like kids at school, like, you know, there's like kids at school who like clearly are going through it and like do not have the access to the resources that you have. Um, but meanwhile, I was like definitely having people call me faggot, definitely being sexually abused. Um, and I remember thinking like, oh, I'm glad I don't have it as bad as like, you know, so it's like it's interesting how like our perspective like is like just so funny like, it's like when you're a kid you just don't have anything to compare it to but looking back to it on it i'm like i think of my little inner child and like all the things that my nickname growing up was jack like what he went through and i'm like oh my god honey that was like so intense you know like just growing up like there and like and having yeah it's intense you've been really open about um the incident of sexual abuse that you've experienced and how that had a sort of cascading impact on the rest of your life is there a point where you, where someone around you highlights the significance of that to you at that age? No, I think that the problem with um, like sexual abuse is so many, and I, you know, I don't like blame anyone for this because it's just like what happens that there's such this like an um, insistence on like like not talking about it, you know, like like don't let anyone find out, and I understand that because like you like it's like you just don't want people to find out like whether it's like bringing shame on the church or bringing shame on like why didn't anyone prevent this so it's like it I don't think it was like I think we just all wanted to like just get through it and I don't think any like there's so much shame and stigma tied up in sexual abuse that I think when it happens you're but at the same time like my mom was really wanted to deal with things like in a very head on way and like really wanted it was like therapy like we gotta get like once she knew she was like fuck like we gotta like but then there was like other forces and like other people in you know our lives that were like i don't think and whether that was like church leaders or other people that were like i don't think that's really you know like what happens if you talk like, do you really want your kid to be like you know it's so there and especially in like small rural spaces and i think that's part of what makes me so angry when we think about um, you know, when people would say, you know, that trans people are, you know, groomers or drag queens or like all this idea that like, queer people are groomers, like there is so much sexual abuse in churches. There is so much sexual abuse in rural communities and urban communities and all the communities. And when you look at the statistics, most often it is like a man that you know. It is like a man in the family, a man in the church, a friend of the family. It's someone that you know. It's like not random queer people. Um, and I just think part of why we have these like fantastical ideas of like these threats to our kids is because of the thing that I was just speaking about that like we don't talk about what really happens because we want to keep it private and we want to keep mm -hmm. things really inside and so when you're like um when you're drawing like it just it makes it and also it's like this like smoke and mirrors thing when you're saying that it's one thing it's like gaslighting really from this whole other thing which in this case is like the pervasive sexual abuse in churches in um, you know, in families and communities that is just so 
you know, not spoken about. And we're over here talking about drag queens and trans people. You said though that your mother was very um, proactive with going to therapy and things like that, which is an incredible thing. Yeah, so for, lucky. for the time, so lucky. especially because even now that's quite seen as being quite a progressive thing to do. Yeah. But but back then, when you're 16 years old, for that to be one of the first sort of suggestions to take you to therapy seems oh, yeah. to be. Honey, I was in therapy when I was five. I remember like when my parents got divorced. I, like I remember like being in therapy when I was so little that like I had to like look up at my mom like this, like holding her hand. You know what I'm saying? Like. Because when they got divorced, we went to like family therapy. So like therapy was always very normalized for me. And my mom, um, it's just like one of the things I just am so grateful to her for that she like normalized therapy. Like, thank God. I don't think I'd be alive without if she hadn't done that. What about if I'd asked that that 16 year old version of you, what what are you going to do when you're older? I always knew I wanted to do hair. Really? Like, but I think my family was like, you need to go to college. So I was like, maybe I was like, I'll be a lawyer or something. But then I was like, girl, you can't be a lawyer. You're going to, I love doing hair. I think I knew I wanted to do hair. Yeah? Yeah. I, I think about my teenage years and I think I didn't know the impact. I, I used the word formative at the start. I didn't know how I'd been formed until I was an adult and I saw like patterns playing out. What were the prints sort of that left on you from your earliest years that stayed with you as an adult? I think my fur, like I went, through, I think one of my big first phases of like, wanting to understand more about like uh like my trauma or like my story it was like Eckhart Tolle and A New Earth and The Power of Now in like 2008 or 9 it was like when Oprah was talking about him and then I was like who's this Eckhart Tolle honey and then I read The Power of Now and A New Earth and I was like hmm ego I don't have an ego what's he talking about and I was like oh that's just like the story that we tell ourselves and I was like so like my story is that I'm like this like gay kid from this little town and I was like abused and like this and that and I love cheer and I love the like really I'm like the observer of that like I'm not really that I'm like this like that was like when I started to learn about like what meditation was and what stillness was and um that really gave me a lot of healing and kind of like clarity and then I uh that didn't last that long because I did eventually get addicted to meth, like not that long after that. So, but thank God I had that introduction to that sort of healing at that time because I was able to come back to it. So that, and then I think, so then my stepdad got really sick. The one I was talking about earlier, um, Steve, he was diagnosed with cancer in like 2009 and I was really far away. I was like living in LA. They were in Illinois and I was in a really, um, you know, difficult working situation. I was like in my first serious relationship. And then all of those, um, all that trauma manifesting itself was came back in terms of like, um, my sexual compulsivity. So I'm like in love for the first time. And I just like was having such a hard time, like in my first relationship, like just cheating nonstop and being like, a, like, which I talk a lot about in my mm-hmm. first book. Um, And so that was when I was like, okay, I really need help. Like, I don't know. Like, so I'd had that versatile introduction to healing with like Eckhart, Mm -hmm. you know, solo 21, 22. Then Steve gets sick. He ultimately dies. And then it's after that, that I'm like, really need help. And that's like, when I get into therapy, that's when I um, start to get into 12 step myself, uh, which I, I think being a non-binary queen, anything that's too much this or that, it's like, so sobriety was like, oh, I just like, I don't want to be totally sober, but I did get a lot of healing there. Um, so I'm kind of a harm reduction queen, but so all through my twenties, I think, and I, and I don't think that we ever get to a place as much as I wish that we would, where you're just like, ah, dealt with my trauma. It's like in a box. And I never have to look at it again. And I never have to deal with it again. And I think it's interesting the ways that your circumstances change and then your trauma or your, you know, that baggage or your ego as, as Eckhart refers to it will like manifest itself in different ways. But I hope that we get, or I hope I get better at, um, like not identifying with the trauma or the ego, like when it's like being a nightmare, even though that's like also a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. Like ask my husband, like where the fuck is my eyeliner? (laughs) You went to um, university, right? Mm -hmm. For a semester. You dropped out like I did. Uh Uh-huh. Why did you drop out? I got really bad grades and then I got addicted to drugs. And then I realized that I wanted to be a hairdresser. So what was I going to waste all that time and money for? If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.